How's it going, everyone? So we're now almost at the end of the election campaign. Uh, at the time of recording this, it's less than 48 hours until polls open. And as I, well, I didn't actually promise, but I'm glad to be doing it. I'm going to be recapping what has happened in the election campaign since the last video I did was at the very beginning. Uh, basically, the stuff that's happened since then, uh, you know, the debates, the things that have come up, uh, the manifestos uh, and the general, my general predictions for what will happen uh, ultimately on Thursday. Starting off from where we left off in the last video, uh, we have since had Farage actually decided he did want to come back and stand as reform leader and therefore as an MP in Clacton, which is the seat that UKIP won in 2015. So if anywhere is going to elect Farage, it's going to be there. Didn't get off to the best start. Uh, he got milkshaked within about 10 minutes. And it's not actually the first time that's happened either. Uh, and there were all people say, oh, what if it could have been a bomb? It's like, if my grandmother had wheels, she would have been a bike. We had the first head to head debate between Sunak and Starmer. And the general consensus was uh, Sunak was whining and Starmer was a bit useless. Uh, Sunak kept hammering away on this lie that he's kept going out for the whole election campaign. Labour's going to raise his taxes by two grand, which is just complete bullshit. And it's funny because the taxes that Labour are going to put up um, and they're not even the ones that were factored into this, you know, fake thing that the Tories came up with are literally stuff on like VAT on private schools, which is supported by most people. The problem with Labour's tax policy is they're not taxing rich people at all. It's like that. And all the polls show that people actually wouldn't mind a little bit more tax if it would, you know, recover the health service and, you know, the public services, get them back on their feet. And the whole election is being steered to the right. And the Tories are essentially set in the election attack lines and Labour are going along with it, which is funny because the Tories are the underdog. It should be Labour that's like set in the agenda. So you'd think that would be happening, but it isn't. We also had a couple of debates in seven way. And those were a lot better, in my opinion, because you actually get got to hear some very political view. Like it, the Greens actually got a platform. It was nice to actually see Nigel Farage get shut up for once. Um, and it was nice to see Labour, I mean, the Tories and Labour, but especially Labour from the left held accountable by, you know, the SNP and the Greens and Plaid Cymru. Uh, and to some extent, the Lib Dems, they, they've done all right. Which brings us on to our next point, the manifesto launches. So I'll kind of just go over the five main parties in Great Britain. I'm not going to go over uh, Plaid Cymru or the SNP or the Northern Irish parties or the or like the Workers' Party of Britain or whatever. So just Labour, Tories, Reform, Greens and Lib Dems. Starting off with, I think they were the ones that were actually first out the gate, the Lib Dems. Their manifesto launch um, is actually all right. Uh, and they actually have got a bit of a boost in the polls from it as well with um, Ed Davies campaign hijinks. Uh, so they've they've gone up a bit in this election campaign. Uh, and the good thing is there'll be a lot of tactical voting for them, which will help them get a lot of seats. Uh, and, you know, their manifesto is actually not too bad, especially with stuff like on the NHS, uh, on social care. Uh, you know, there's a few tax things in there that are all right. Uh, you know, it doesn't it doesn't go that far. There's stuff like, I don't know, legalizing weed and this and, you know, votes at 16, which is also Labour and Green policy. We'll see if Labour stick to that when they're in govern government, but I hope they do. A sewage tax on water companies. They want to rejoin the single market, which would probably be a good thing. Also had some pretty good um, housing policies. I think 1.5 million homes over a parliament, half of them council houses. It's definitely not the greatest manifesto in history, but I could easily hold my nose and vote for it. Uh, and I would, and to be honest, it's like, it's to the left of the Labour Party, uh, which we'll talk about now. So Labour Manifesto is fine. It's, uh, well, actually, it's not really like, it's kind of, it's got baked in 18 billion of pounds of spending cuts because they're not investing in public services. So them and the Tories will get to reform. They're awful on it. Uh, I've baked in 18 billion pounds of spending cuts that are on the way. And 
because the tax thresholds are frozen, there's going to be real terms tax rises, whoever gets in anyway, on like average workers, which is funny because the whole election is about, you know, Labour and the Tories saying we won't raise taxes. Well, you've already committed to raising taxes on the majority of people. There's some good stuff in there. Like, as I said, vote 16, renationalise the railways, but it won't be immediate. Uh, there's some stuff that's kind of BS, like Great British Energy, but it's not actually a publicly owned energy company. It's a publicly owned investment company. So it doesn't actually, you know, address our problems of, you know, profiteering and private energy companies making record profits and getting to do whatever they want instead of us being in control of it and being able to invest it in the ways we want and get the money back. The general problem with Labour's manifesto is it spends so little because they don't actually raise taxes where you can get the money, where the money is gone. That's where the money has gone to the rich. You could tax it back like a wealth tax because then they can't leave the country. And you could invest it in the economy, in the future of this country. And for example, the two child benefit cap, Labour keeps saying they can't scrap it because they don't have the money for it. The money is literally in the manifesto because they've raised nine, nine billion and the two child benefit cap would cost like two billion to get rid of and it helps the economy anyway. They're only spending like five or six billion anyway. So you still have physical headroom if you scrapped it. It's not the worst manifesto in history, but man, I mean, the camera is mirrored, but I've got the previous Labour manifestos here. They are so much better, let's be honest. All right. Oh, it didn't win the election. That that doesn't that doesn't determine whether they're good policies or not. In some ways, the 2019 Tory manifesto is more um, interventionist on public spending than this Labour Party manifesto is. But anyway, alas, we move on to the Greens, which actually had the best manifesto. Probably they're doing a wealth tax, um, which will raise tens of billions actually going to properly invest in the nhs publicly owned um water and energy companies uh you know that would be nice raise the minimum wage to 15 quid an hour and equalize it as well labor are going to equalize it but they're not going to raise it at least not any more than the tories will uh that's for all ages and also the the point is it's not when it comes to uh raising taxes it's not just about, oh, the politics of envy. You know, you don't have to tax rich people. Just make everyone else better off. It's like, no, because if the rich get richer and the poor get a little bit less poor, the rich have more buying power. In that scenario, the poor are poorer by default. We use money as a way to measure what we buy. But money on its own has no value. It's only with all the stuff around us that actually has value, you know, like assets and stuff, which is, you know, what a wealth tax would tax and capital gains tax. That's another one. Overall, pretty good manifesto from the Greens. And of course, you know, as you'd expect from the Lib Dems, they want to rejoin the single market, which would probably be a good thing. And the Greens are really the only party that's offering any actual genuine change at this election. And so you should vote Green. Labour are going to win whatever. Like, they genuinely are. And I will get to talking about what will happen after the election in a minute. Talk about the Tory manifesto briefly. The general policy policy base of it was we're going to cut welfare, even though we've already cut it, like, to down to the bones. And we're going to use that on tax cuts. But like we said, taxes are already, you know, in real terms, taxes will be going up. And we got the highest tax burden for 70 years but to be fair a tax burden isn't necessarily a bad thing if you raise taxes on the rich and corporations the tax burden goes up as well you know tax is not a bad thing it's just where you tax people and the problem is we have really regressive taxes in this country particularly with things like council tax um or capital gains being taxed at a lower rate to income tax which is what i discussed already uh, that's pretty much the Tory manifesto. They know they're not going to lose. So it's just, you know, throw whatever we can out and see, you know, whatever scraps we can to to the pensioners and stuff. Oh, we're going to cut your taxes after we raise them. Uh, the reform manifesto was probably the dumbest. It They're going to. OK, so they're going to raise the rate of personal allowance to 20 grand a year. I wouldn't be opposed to raising it to maybe 15 grand, but we don't have the money to raise it to 20 grand and, you know, invest in public services unless you want to tax, start taxing the other bands at higher rates, um, which is actually something you could do. So you say you raise the 
the personal allowance threshold from 12 and a half grand to 15 grand and then you add a penny on each income tax band above that so 21p 41p 46p so overall everyone is paying the same amount of tax but people on a lower income are excluded from tax and then obviously if you have higher minimum wage and better benefits then everyone's wages are better because the rich have to give more uh but it's they it's the same as this trust they want to give small tax breaks for the poor and then massive tax cuts for the rich which goes back to my previous point of then the rich have more buying power anyway they want to cut corporation tax from 25 percent on big business and this is not the bottom rate of corporation tax which is 19 percent. they want to cut it from 25 percent to 15 percent who does that serve they also want to leave the european convention on human rights uh and just just kind of dumb shit like that and oh uh net zero migration uh if you thought the rwanda policy from the tories was stupid like oh yeah we're, we're gonna have yeah net zero migration even though it's like if you want to have a conversation about immigration being too high for the economy to sustain, that's fair enough. But like the reason we've got high immigration is because we got collapsing birth rates. When Farage talks about, oh, we used to have controlled immigration, it's because everyone was having kids. We didn't need immigrants to come over yeah, um, and do jobs because ev- we had loads of people in the country. And the fact is, we do have enough space. Like we are a small country, but we do have space and resources to build more to you know invest more in the future of this country so that generally sums up the manifestos now we will get to uh just stuff that's been happening so there was obviously the you know there's been endless lists of shit that's happened with the tories this election the d-day shit with sunak going off early and then the betting scandal it's a complete shower shit which culminated in reform briefly in some polls actually overtaking the tories But I do think they've peaked now. And I think on election day, which is only in a few days, they won't do as well as some of those earlier polls that had them on 20% or so had them looking. It's it's very much Clegmania again, Uh, which is funny. Lib Dems were taking votes from Labour in that election. And now Farage is taking votes from the Tories when they're coming out of government. It also hasn't, but it hasn't all been great for reform. And part of the reason it's been going pretty badly for reform is because Nigel Farage um, doesn't really know when to shut up uh, like his Ukraine comments which if you want to say that the war could have been predicted like fair enough Um, and I'm not like some you know massive NATO supporter I generally I generally you know I support Ukraine's right to defend itself but I think Farage fucked up there especially because the British right are generally pro-Ukraine it's not like American right wingers And following this was the whole racism scandal with all these reform candidates saying pretty racist shit. And I think most of them have been deselected. But it's like, maybe you need to look in the mirror if so many racists are coming to your party. And it's like, like they have said some pretty terrible shit. And like Farage refuses to take any responsibility um, because he is racist. Let's be honest. Speaking of racism, uh, there was also the comments Starmer made about people coming from Bangladesh and they needed to be deported, which is strange because people in Bangladesh have never been in like the top 20 people claiming asylum in the UK. Uh, so it, it genuinely makes no sense. And he actually said it with quite a lot of aggression. It was, it was kind of weird. Uh, you know, you combine that with they've, you know, been like basically tried to silence Martin Ford, who's the guy who made this Ford report talking about anti-black racism with the Labour Party. Um, you know, what happened with Diane Abbott, uh, you know, obviously they went went back on it because it turned out to be a shit show. And also the fact that they've now abandoned Clacton against Farage. Um, but, you know, they're pouring all these resources into seats against the Greens and into Islington North against Corbyn. It really makes you think it's like, are these the same people that was that saying they've detoxified the Labour Party or whatever, or they've they've fixed it, you know? I don't really I don't really buy that. I got to be honest. I was surprised when I made my last video that the culture war and like, you know, anti wokeness oh, uh, trans your kids are all being indoctrinated to be trans. I was actually kind of surprised that that hadn't really come up in the election. Uh but it actually did. And in fact, Starmer was saying he wanted to meet with JK Rowling to talk with her about why she won't vote labor, which is like like 
even even if you like agree with her, it's like she's one voter out of what forty eight million people on the electoral register. It seems it seems very weird. You just meet up with a random person to persuade them instead of I don't know going out to the country and like persuading loads of people that you know they need to vote Labour. Actually offering a positive vision, uh, and so the Tories have kind of been going on this a bit because you know they got no attack line. You know, oh, we're gonna, you know, change the uh, Equality Act or whatever. But it's pretty desperate stuff, and I don't think Starmer is actually any different policy-wise. So it's kind of funny. But ultimately, this election is a referendum on the Conservative Party and their time in office, everything that's happened, austerity, Brexit, Windrush, Grenfell, Partygate. You know, the lies, the corruption, the sleaze, the wasted money, all the deaths in COVID, you know, all the deaths to austerity, the rich getting richer, the poor getting poorer. All of our public services being either completely destroyed or sold off. So they deserve to get absolutely destroyed at this election. But unfortunately, it doesn't seem like Labour will be offering the change this country actually needs. Uh, And with that, I want to talk about my final predictions for this election and what I think um, will happen. So I've got a few here, uh, but I will leave you on a more positive note once I'm done with this. So my general predictions are it will be the worst ever result for the Tories. And I do think they will get less than 100 seats. But I can imagine there being a shy Tory vote and they get, you know, they get over 100 and they actually do all right especially seeing as it seems like reform has peaked now. Labour will get a bigger majority than in 1997 and probably a 200-seat one at that. But it is also very likely, um, in fact, it's pretty much guaranteed they get less votes than 2017, which is pretty funny. Uh, so they get they win a majority bigger than Blair with less votes than Corbyn got seven years ago. I think Corbyn will hold his seat in Islington North. It's going to be close, but, you know, I hope... I. God, I fucking hope he does, because if anyone deserves to be re-elected to Parliament, it's him. I think there'll be a turnout drop of at least four points. I mean, probably five, but, you know, I want to be safe. It was 67% of the last election, even though it was a winter, you know, December, mid-December election with two relatively unpopular leaders. It would make sense if turnout dropped a bit. The conditions are in place, especially when everyone already knows what's going to happen in this election anyway. I think at least one high-profile Labour MP will lose their seat could be to the Greens, it could be um, in Bristol Central, it could be uh, in, you know, to an independent in Birmingham or whatever, uh, it could be, you know, in London with um, West Streeting, though I don't think that Leanne Mohammed will actually beat him, but she is a very good candidate and I really hope she does, but I don't think she will. And we'll get to that in a second. I think it'll be the highest ever seat total for the Lib Dems, or at least close to it, uh, despite losing votes on 2019. The best ever result for the Greens in terms of seats and vote share. I think Liz Truss or Rishi Sunak may actually lose their seat. It, there's a good chance it doesn't happen, but oh, it would be so fucking funny if it did. Especially with Sunak, with Nico and Count Binface standing behind him, as they will, just in some you know shitty leisure centre as at 4am as they're announcing the results. That will be pretty funny, I can't lie. And for some predictions about the other parts of the UK, I think the SNP will still win in Scotland in terms of plurality of the vote and seats, at least one of the two. Uh, but it is going to be very close. But I am kind of going against the polls because the polls have Labour slightly ahead in Scotland. I do think the SNP will just barely pull through. I think Sinn Féin wins in Northern Ireland. uh, And I'll get to exact seat predictions in a minute. And uh, let's throw in a Wales prediction. Lowest Tory vote in 100 years in Wales. There we go. Now, let's get to the seat and vote share predictions. So in terms of seats, I'm predicting 428 for Labour. That would be up 227 from the last election in 2019. Conservatives on 93, which would be down 272. Lib Dems on 67, which would be up 56. SNP on 26, which would be which would be down 22. Uh, Reform on seven, which would be you know seven new ones. They don't have any seats. Brexit Party didn't get any MPs last time. I think the Greens will get four, which would be up three. 
uh, holding Brighton and gaining Bristol Central, Waveney Valley and North Herefordshire, uh, they could potentially gain a fifth or a sixth seat. But I think those ones will happen. Plaid Cymru, I think, will get three seats, which would be down one from the 2019 election. And others, four, excluding Northern Ireland, I'll get to that in a second, which would be the Speaker of the House, Corbyn in Islington North, George Galloway in Rochdale. I think he'll probably get re-elected, but it'll be pretty close. And other, which could mean the independence in Ashfield, which will be funny because um, everyone's thinking, oh, what if Lee Anderson wins it as reform? But like, there's a very high chance the independents actually win it. Uh, Pfizer Shaheen in London. Uh, as I said, there's a couple of candidates standing in Birmingham. Uh, they're not actually that great. There's some random guy off TikTok that's standing against Labour. So, you know, those those people could do pretty well. And I, basically any of those. Also, as I said, in Ilford, Liam Mohammed. I don't think Andrew Feinstein standing against Starmer has any chance of winning. But it would be pretty funny if Starmer and Sunak both lost their seats. That would probably be the greatest moment in this whole election that I could think of. And quickly get into the Northern Irish parties. Eight seats for Sinn Féin, which would be up one. DUP on six, which would be, which would be down two. Socialist, Democratic and Labour Party on two, which would be the same. And the Alliance Party would gain one seat, which would be from Sinn Féin. I can't remember the exact seat. So that is my seat predictions. And now I will give you the final vote share predictions uh, and my some closing thoughts on what could happen after the election. And a little bit of hope, actually. So. I think Labour will get 38%, which would be up five from their 29 team result in Great Britain. Conservatives, 21%, that'd be down 23. Reform on 16%, which would be up 14 from the Brexit party result then, although to be fair, they stood down in half the seats. Lib Dems on 11%, which would be down one, but since the Tories are collapsing in all their target seats, they're going to win anyway. And, you know, tactical voting helps that too. Greens on 8%, which would be up five points and their best ever result at a Westminster election. The SNP on 3%, which would be down one. Uh, and the others on 4%, which would be up two from the 2019 result. That's generally what I think with obviously, as I said, a turnout of around 62, 63, maybe 64%. I don't think it will get that high. And my closing thoughts and a bit of hope I want to give you is... Essentially, after this election, it's a blank canvas. Anything could happen. We could have, uh, you know, the Tories could recover and start polling all right again. Reform could be the main party. <laughs> Labour could become really popular in this honeymoon period that every government has starting off. But I don't know if Starmer will even get a honeymoon period because he's pretty unpopular as it is. And I don't know how long him just talking the right talk while implementing austerity is gonna you know appease people even if he you know chucks of throws us a few bones every now and then so you know labor could you know hold on to their popularity or you know maybe the greens could um start rising some more and become a serious main political party uh you know maybe some other left-wing party rises out of the ashes uh because at the end of the day, the Greens are the ones on economic policies, which are the most important to the British public. Um, the gr British public overwhelmingly support them and they're, you know, fully funded and it makes sense. And other countries do similar things. And so my that's my general takeaway from this. Uh, hope you enjoyed. Uh, vote Green on the 4th of July. And uh, either way, I'm going to be enjoying, you know, my first general election where I can vote. Uh, it would be nice. It's nice to not have too many stakes in this election. Just be able to sit back and watch the Tories fall apart as we elect a new set of Tories. So, yeah. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, make sure you like, subscribe, all that stuff. And, I mean, well, I'll see you in, with a different government, most likely. But I don't know when I'll do another video. Maybe I'll do a video talking about the aftermath. Uh, but, to be honest, not really sure if I can be asked. So, yeah, hope you enjoyed and see you later.